Uh, if I could sum Carl Cox up in three words, uh, larger than life. Fun-loving guy. A happy family smile. Sick as hell. Fun, generous, and talented. My DJing inspiration. Massive, energetic, phenomenal. A real brother. Generous, passionate, and a little bit mad. He loves music. Friend. Humble. He's generous. Devastating. Professional. Integrity. Smile. Outrageous. Oh, a third one. And generosity. An innovator. I would say friend. Insane. And legend. Yeah, no, he's just calm. Big, gappy smile. Big, cuddly bear. Cox never stops. He is a chocolate Buddha. Definitely. Big, black Cox. In this world, it's a guy. The first time when I came to Ibiza, I actually, um, I was about 17 years old and um, having a holiday at the time was kind of like, how do you do that, you know? And the only, the only way you was able to do it is if you came to this sort of islands and you was able to work for a nightclub, giving away tickets, that meant you can get, get into the club, drink as much as you like, as long as you've got a certain amount of people in. I actually chose to come to Ibiza. Um, in 1984. So I've been coming here every year since then. I've not missed one year. Um, it's been a part of my life system and you know, I'll always enjoy it for that. But really I came in here uh, on completely ground zero basis. Um, my girlfriend at the time, Maxine Bradshaw, and my sister, uh, they also wanted to come over with me. So we hired a, a Fiat Panda, uh, which was a very low budget car. and. Uh, and we stayed and for two or three nights in the car because <laughs> we couldn't afford to stay anywhere else. So at night, <clears throat> we'd park up and we'd move the chairs down and I'd kind of cut it up with Maxine and my sister was in the back. And then the sun would rise <laughs> and burn us in the car. <laughs> so we were to get up and then, uh, and then we'd go to one of the hostels and then have a wash and brush up and then that was it to see the day. I was, I was in heaven when I came here, you know, and then if the DJ was playing some really good music and then I was there, that, that was for me, I mean, my life was always about going out. I mean, I was actually a, a dancer before I was a DJ, so therefore I wanted to go and dance into all these clubs and, uh, and that's how it all started for me. So I had a really good understanding of, what's, of what I'm doing now today based on what my intro was of when I started to come to Ibiza. Love you, love you. Love you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for so late, huh? Yeah, but Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Not the> way. <laughs> yeah. Everybody loves him. Everybody loves him. Why? I don't know. But everybody loves him. He he touched the people by the hair. You understand? 
and this is his secret. He doesn't know it, but everybody loves him. Oh, so How are you? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. I called yesterday, just so you know. I yeah, I know. No, yeah, no, I've yeah. got that. Yeah, you always. <laughs> always at the time, man. Nice. Good to see you. Look great. Thank you. Likewise. I don't think Carl really has to do very much. He just has something in him. Carl has this integrity to himself and he enjoys and he has passion. And when you have passion and integrity, things kind of fall into place. Tuesday? I mean, it's just fine. It's a work of art. Really? We're dead space for sure. Yeah, really. <laughs> wow. I'm impressed. XXL? <laughs> XXL? <laughs> it's okay. That's why I came down. did my kind of like groundwork, you know, I played at Pasha, played at the Privilege, Amnesia, I played at Summum, um, I played at Star Club, which is now Eden. I did the whole thing for years, you know, and it got to a point where I didn't want to confuse the public anymore. I wanted people to come and see me at one place, one place only, therefore they can get the full benefit of Carl Cox. We were trying uh, to convince Carl that uh, in Ibiza uh, space could be his own area where he could connect with Ibiza uh, brand of music and crowd, etc, etc, etc. Pepe, you know, uh, at the time he could see that there was something about my attitude towards the place and how I felt about it was a lot different to most people that he's ever met. And, and he's followed that path in, in the sense of supporting me and who I am as an, as an individual. We were in, the, in a disposition to give uh, an, an answer uh, and to give an opportunity to Carl to create something by himself, something different than other clubs would do it. We just thought, well, why don't we just open up earlier? I'll be able to do uh, like a, uh, a cold cock sessions on the terrace. And then, and then, therefore, we would have already got our night started before 12 o'clock. So we basically changed the ethics of clubbing for, for space right there, right there. I think space is really about, uh, really about the music. And I think that's the thing that Carl attracts with his parties and his whole concept as well. So that's what I love about it. Ibiza is the centre point these days for dance music in the whole world. And so it's only a few months, but it's so important. I think it's a DJ dream you know, running his own night on the island, Ibiza. Carl and Eric Murillo and Pete and Jules, they have an affinity with the island where they become part of the island and become part of the scene rather than just flying out there and doing a gig. The most of the DJs have their best times when they play in Ibiza because the crowd is mixed, everybody is full of energy, everybody wants to have a good time, this is the reason why they went to Ibiza. He's been able to evolve with the islands and ultimately kind of, you know, that, that evolution has led to this point now where he's got this kind of this amazing night on this amazing island. I always play at Carl's Night at Space and because he just gets the best crowd um, and he played after me and I stood there on the side for like an hour just watching, enjoying Dancing, smiling, learning. Oh, come on, can I you like it? Oh, that's beautiful, man. Right? There was yeah. one with uh, Calavera. Yes. You know, kind of Ed Hardy style. Yeah, I know yeah, you yeah. were Ed Hardy. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it was nice, but it was the sphere was like this. Yeah. <laughs> Carl loves this food. So he moves the restaurant, but we have it. So that I hope everybody will enjoy it. This is some Ibithenkan lobster with uh, Pepe Rosselló flour, okay? <laughs> Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! Hey! 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 H
when I presume about France around my life, and especially on my job, I always face Lynn, Carl, and all of you as a part of myself. And of course, you are there and you are here, and it is the best we can have together with you and sharing together our time, especially at this very special day and very special moment. Thank you. Thank you. We are family. This, this is the, the, the thing. I feel them like a part of my person, my family, because my love and my, my, my respect is 100% for, for them. And uh, I'm happy they are here, and I hope they never leave it. <laughs> it's his birthday today, and um, you know he's got to go off and do a radio show in a couple of hours' time. And for seven years, he's been producing um, and presenting a weekly radio show that goes out on the world's best FM stations. He's got an audience of like seven, eight million people that tune in every single week. Then he's going to have to go off and play on the terrace for a couple of hours. Then he'll have a little bit of a break and he's got to go and play for another three or four hours in the main room. I mean, that's a long set. So it's understood of the reasons why I do this because I love, I love it. I, I love being here and I, mean, so I love sharing my birthday here every summer. I mean, this is where I am, so it's, it's kind of like a, an annual event in some way called Cox's birthday. Aquí en el estudio Carl Cox, una de las mejores sesiones del verano esta noche en Space. Carl Cox here, playing some brand new music for you, and for tonight it's going to be Boomba. <laughs> It's really nice to be able to play the music I enjoy and, uh, and then later you hear the real power of the sound. Yeah. luchando por muchos años, dando tu alegría y tu energía para todo el mundo y para la gente de Ibiza. Gracias, I mean, it's a radio station, they had a little energy, you know, and uh, it's really important that you get to do that now on the island, you know, it sets it up for, for people that uh, may not even come down to the club, but might come down there, could have heard the sound and seen they heard the hype and everything, and, uh, but now going on to do, do my, what I do live and uh, hopefully people get it. <laughs> What I do is tune, tune what I need as a level to the room itself. And when it gets filled up, filled, up, filled up here, it sucks in all the sound. So you know, we always give ourselves enough headroom so when there's, there's a lot of people here we can, we can push the sound up a bit more and it still won't disturb the sound. But as long as we don't have any distortion from this point on, and then we're going to be fine when we push the music up even further to the end of the night. And that's what we're looking for as a perfect sound. I think the first record of Carl's that I knew, if I remember it correctly, it was called I Want You Forever. And at least I think that's, that was the one I heard. And, and uh, I had put out a song called Go, and it was on one of many rave compilations. And I was listening to the compilation, and I heard the Carl Cox track as well. This was probably like the summer of 1991. He was a huge breakbeat DJ, but he also was mixing techno and house. He was, you know, he made, he created the bridges into the genres like this. He's, he's reinventing himself in many ways to different crowds, and people have seen him from their um, younger days and now that perhaps some of their sons and daughters are going out to watch car, you know? He's, I think, uh, definitely an example to, to the younger guys, you know, in terms of uh, how professional he is. If you look at where, you know, both myself and Carl have come from, we've both worked really, really hard to get where we are. It's, you know, it's many, many years of, of working your way up, building your profile. You know, he was, he was the Don 28 years ago. Intimate moment. Mamma mia. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Wow. Is that sealed with a kiss? Yeah. Really, I'm touched. I'm, very, I'm touched. Very Thank you. Wow. Whoa. Nice. They do a great job for the whole summer. They're here. They are part of uh, Carcock's success in this wonderful night that we, we do at the space. 
and I thought they deserve this and not only this, much much more. This is only something physical you touch but they deserve the feeling, the love, the caring and everything. around the world many times and I can st I still get the buzz you know I'm not the performer Carl's performing but I still feel what he's feeling you know and what he's giving in some ways and I, and I get I feel what he's receiving from the people too I think uh, the thing with Carl is he brings so much energy into the room when he walks in there the whole place as soon as they see him and they see him in the booth he's got that rhythm of the way he moves and it, it, you can just see the crowd starting to move with his rhythm. His music is for the soul. He knows exactly what people want to hear. And the minute he's on, it's like my body moves. Everything in my body just shakes. And I just want to put my hand up. And I'm so excited to see him today. We love Carl. We would like to thank Carl Cox for putting our club on the map. Let me tell you a story. We opened, and when we first opened, the police shut us down. We lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. We were on the ropes. Business wasn't good. And then Carl agreed to play here New Year's Eve and put us on the mat and lifted our club up. And we cannot thank him enough. So um, thank you, Carl, if you're watching your DVD. One of the few DJs where people in New York will come on and fall out. And it's a, it's a full night on when Carl Cox is playing. At the end of the day, it's all about the music. And if you're not a good DJ, you shouldn't be here. <laughs> Carl used to play extremely hard at Twilo, even at Twilo with his wonderful sound system. And uh, some people used to get scared and run away. And then we us, the staff, and everybody else were like, bring it on, Carl. Bring it on. Welcome to New York City. You know, there's something about him. He always, you know, ha like, okay, for example, like today, he has a gig here at Pasha. He came to sound check and, you know, to make sure everything was right. He has, like, an enthusiasm, like, sort of for every gig. He, he, you know, every gig he treats it like, you know, people are coming. Look at the line here. People are coming to hear Carl Cox. They're paying their money, and he's giving them their money's worth. To please the New York crowd is really tough it's, because they want to be given something. They, they need to feel that you're here for a reason, you know, not just to play big commercial hit records, whatever. It's like bring your soul to the, to the dance floor. And Last Night of Pasha was just completely all about that still, you know. I mean, I went on at 1 o'clock, finished at 5, 5.30. Club was packed, Victor went on. I don't know how, what time he's probably still playing now, I don't know. No, uh, <laughs> no, sure. If you can get them people together and, and basically get them all dancing under the one beat, it really, you really feel that coming back, you know, which is awesome. And if you break America, they always say you break America. Uh, sorry, you break New York, you can break America. Without Carl, New York would be in trouble. Uh, first time I came to Las Vegas was around about 1995-96. I mean, in the early days, they were talking about the uh, early rave parties that used to happen 
here in the desert. And then people just, uh, after the rave party, used to come to Vegas for, to carry on their weekend. Um, but that was one of, the, one of the reasons for coming over as well, because the music started to creep into Vegas at this time. But when I first came, I had no real idea of the magnitude of what this place is actually like. It's, you have to come here to, un to understand how big it is. But when I came, it was already big to begin with because all the hotels, even at that time, were just the biggest things I've ever seen in my life. Most of the clubs now are built in the casinos. So you get you do get a lot of kind of like people who are coming to, to, to have a really good time in the casinos, have you know come to have parties in the hotel rooms. And if I turn up to do my set here, you know, it adds to the rest of their, their, their trip uh, coming over here. But you do get a lot of people who understand the music and it's and it's now a part of the society here in, in Vegas where you've got people who also look for that as well, which I think is important. Vegas is a 24-hour town. I mean, you can jack it up as much as you like here. Uh, or you can relax as much as you like it, it's up to you what you want to do. I mean, my first, I would say, five years of Vegas, I don't remember too much of it. Um, it's been a bit of a blur most of the time. But meanwhile, as far as I'm concerned, it's something which I, I, which I, which I always enjoy. <laughs> I mean, in, in Vegas, it's hard to keep the attention uh, of people in one spot because there's so much to do here, so many places to go, so many people to see. And, and, and you know, if I've got people in the club for at least four or five hours, then my job is done in Vegas. This is one thing what I like coming to Vegas because of things like this. This is just awesome. I think we need one of these at home. Oh, I've got my headphones as usual. <laughs> I don't normally leave them, but you know, sometimes I mean, I'll try to check everything, and then uh, you know, the most important thing that I need. You always headphones. remember everything. Normally, I do. Yeah. Carl and I found ourselves in Marbella, and we thought we'd join the jet set for a long weekend and rent a Ferrari. And so we were sort of driving around, sort of you know, trying to show off. And I think it was my turn to drive, and I remember taking a wrong turn and then reversing the Ferrari backwards into a very high kerb. And I think, unless you've done this, the noise of scraping fiberglass on concrete is excruciating when it's not your car and you've got a huge deposit on it. And um, yeah, we got out and we had ripped this side skirt to bits. Thoroughly, I was thoroughly embarrassed as the driver. And what we did do though, which was even better, we got some lipstick off of some girls we were staying with to try to touch up the, the side skirt in Ferrari red. Didn't work, lost the deposit. I think Ferraris would think, but probably best left alone. It was definitely the bus tour when uh, they picked me up <laughs> on the bus. And it was actually the first morning waking up with Carl Cox somewhere in a room or in a, in a bus. I see Carl going straight to the fridge, open up, getting this big fat ass burrito. I mean, it was 11 o'clock in the morning and he put it in the microwave and he just killed that stuff. I was very impressed. I'm like, okay, Carl. I did have a fantastic game of table football with him. Upstairs here. <laughs> he actually wrenched the players out of the, out of the, ball, the um, table. We, it got so intense. He's like, arr, arr, arr. And then he's, he's got like three footballers on a skewer. He's like, oh, sorry. And it was a very windy day. And in a certain moment, Carl was there. Ja, 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 ja. And he got the record and put inside on the plate. And the record makes, boom, escape. And a, a, a few moments later, the record fall down again on his own table. It was something which I remember, and he was also shocked about this. And it was amazing. All the flags were winding, and it was a mess, you know. Carl uh, is not that drinker at all, and it was. I love to drink, and it was quite easy for me to give him some drinks. And to see him tipsy was very, very funny. I mean, he turned to the little baby and started to do jokes with me and everything. Like, okay. No more alcohol for you, Carl. <laughs> if you're on the dance floor, you love it when these big guys sweating his head off and he's like smiling and throwing records in and 
you, you know, there's something happening in the room. It's vibrant. It's alive. And then together with his musical taste and the charisma that he has, it's it's a you know it's a one in a million combination. There's only few people who have it, and he has it. You know, the magazines and the interviews all focus on the champagne life and the fake tits and, you know, the club life and how great it is. But there is a real, there's, there's a big work aspect to what we do. I think the key to Carl Cox's success is the fact that he's very good at what he does. Um, he works incredibly hard. He's a genuinely nice person. And he tours incessantly. He lives in a club, he doesn't really, you know, like, he's always traveling, he's always, always, always pushing his sound somewhere in the world. You never see Carl look pissed off or he's always got a smile on his face. You know, it doesn't matter if he's just got off a, you know, 20 hour flight or whatever else, you know, he might be like, and then he walks in the club and it's like, boom. Uh, you have gig after gig and, you know, different countries and you're not sleeping or whatever, but whenever he shows up and he sees the crowd, um, I think, you know, the kind of symbiotic relationship he has with the crowd enables him to really sort of perk up and, and get into it and, uh, and give a really good performance. We're now in Atlanta from Vegas. Oh, got up at nine o'clock in the morning to leave Vegas at 10.30 and we actually landed here in Atlanta, losing three hours uh, at about half past seven. So uh, most of the day's gone now. But he's gone, but he went straight to the club to our soundtrack, probably the quickest soundtrack I've ever done, um, purely based on time. But uh, we've got some good guys down there that can uh, set it up for us real quick and it seems all right. So fingers crossed everything will be fine for tonight. If it ain't, we'll soon know about it. <laughs> The first time I went to the WMC in Miami was about 1994, where I stayed at the world-famous Fontainebleau Hotel where the WMC was being held. And uh, for me, this was where the epicenter of all delegates would go to meet other DJs, producers, writers, uh, club owners, uh, everything you can think of to do with dance music. It was happening right there. Every DJ in the planet are in Miami for the Winter Music Conference at this time. Especially for the English, we treat it as our music industry summertime. Because you, <laughs> you can go on the beach and you can hang out and have a really good time with uh, the locals. Also hanging out uh, and enjoying the sun. Where normally in England, the sun hasn't even come out yet until at least the end of June. But meanwhile, this is the scene set in Miami. So for us, it was always something of a pleasure to end up at Miami at this time. It's so bustling with so many different cultures and, and people from all over the world coming to hear DJs, check out new music, what's going to be hot for this year in the sense of new tune, what's going to be the hot parties, what DJs are rocking it, what DJs are not, what DJs are not rocking it. But meanwhile, everyone's here for the one reason, one reason only, and that's because of the music. How's life? Does he have a pass? Yeah, it's good. Does he have a pass? Hello, how are you? Mom. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Welcome. I have a good mind to go in and tell everyone, you know what, just, just 
gonna, it's still early. Yeah, you know what I mean? Everybody pace themselves. Pace themselves already. They didn't want to rock in the house. What's up, it's Pete. We're backstage right now. Ultra Music Festival, 10th anniversary. And I got some guy I'm sitting with, you might have heard of him. The one, the only, the icon, the ambassador of this music, Mr. Carl Cox. Uh, going to a club where Carl's playing is more about him. He can play anywhere, at any time, and he's the only one that will always rock every single dance floor, which is massively inspirational. And it's the second he comes on the decks, you know Carl Cox has arrived. The first thing that happens when you listen to Carl DJ is you start dancing and smiling. I think he really pushed techno to the forefront um, and, and in many ways popularized it from the very beginning. I think Carl chooses great music that makes people dance. I think he hears things in the music that other people probably don't hear and his coordination when he puts things together is absolutely unmatched. So that I think is why he's the man. Everyone's like, Oh. This is a religion. Carl Cox has a religion, people. <laughs> it's my Buddha. Go and party, yeah, you know, like the Berliners, yes. you know, I'm making we can after party, you know, for like yeah. two or three days and four beer. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is Carl Cox, and you are listening to Hit the Decks with Rudy Kaiser. The actual school is called the California Superbike School, and the purpose, of, the purpose of the school is to help anybody of any level corner their motorcycles more effectively. When Carl first came to the school, he was in the classroom, a very attentive student, I have to say. A guy comes over to me, he says, ah, Carl Cox is on the school. I went, ah, now I know why I know that face. So, and to be fair, he came along, you know, there's, there's no superstar or anything. He came along as a biker, just like everybody else. That's his passion, that, that's, that's what we wanted to do, and he just wanted to blend in, and he did it perfectly, you know. Um, it's, it's spot on, absolutely spot on. A lot of people get an insight to actually what really happens. People think you get on these bikes and then why you go around the track, but it's just not like that at all. Okay. Too bad for the first one for the day. You've got to come, come straight into it. Um, there's a few things I've got to learn. And uh, well, that's why I'm here at the end of the day. Turn one, did you get the point what I was making there? Because when you went through the time before, you went out quite wide. I did, yeah. They're not going to let me go around and think I'm brilliant all day long. They're going to, whatever little bit they need to pick up on, which can make all the difference, and then by all means come out and, and show me what's wrong. Carl's riding skills have come along nicely. I've spoken to his coach a couple of times during, throughout the day. Uh, they're progressing quite nicely. He's, he's working on the level two skills, which are the visual skills today, which they're harder to get in place than the stuff he did on level one. Uh, but once, that, once they dial in, he's going to get a huge big win out of it. And, and again, speaking to his coach, his coach is saying that he's, he's here as a student. There's, there's no superstar. He's, Christ, he's just such a down-to-earth person. Every control action you perform on a bike, 
is related directly to what you see. Uh, the, the reason that you always hit something when you target fix on it is because you don't, you, you become unaware of your peripheral vision. Your eyes, right? Very simple devices. Um, they were designed to pick up three things. <laughs> Looks around the room first. Right, women. <laughs> danger. Food. Women. Okay, now the danger doesn't have to be real. A curb on the outside of a corner is not dangerous. It's just a piece of ground. However, if you were to run over it and the bike became unstable and you lost grip, then you have the perception of danger, and that's then why the eyes would target fix on it. Uh, knowledge is power at the end of the day. I mean, um, I really don't need to really learn much more apart from just getting out there and doing it now by what I've learned in practice. Try and do as many ride days as possible, track days as possible. Try not to come off. <laughs> ride within your limits and have a really good time. Guys. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Captain Tobias Wilcock welcoming you aboard Coconut Airways Flight 372 to Bridgetown, Barbados. We will be flying at an height of 32,000 feet and at an airspeed of approximately 600 miles per hour. Well, the thing is about, you know, my mum and dad coming from Barbados. I mean, when they came over from Barbados into England in, in the late 50s, you know, they came over to work, you know, and in the end, I'm not sure if they really wanted to to have a family, but here I am, <laughs> hello, and two sisters, you know. We wanted him to become a um, photographer, you know, other things we wanted him to become, nothing to do with music at all. No, Carl, no, you finish, you finish your schooling, or you're almost finished, what do you want to do? <laughs> I hear you play, well, you want to be a bus driver. <laughs> We lived in a quite small house, but uh, we were, you know, a tight family unit, you know. But dad was a bus driver, mum was a midwife. That's what they ever did, you know. I mean, for me, it, it was always like I never really wanted to, to, to be either of these people. I, I grew up with music in my blood. I mean, I blame my father for, you know, allowing me to, to play records when he didn't want to play records. But you know, it's probably been one of the best things that happened in my life based on what I've, what I've achieved since then. I would play at. Parties and, and uh, gigs, uh, weddings, I used to play there. So I, I used to take him along with me. And when I got tired, I used to turn it over to him. He was a big music player from a very, very young age. And he actually brought the, um, the Twin Deck system himself. He would sit at the piano and he would listen to the radio and he would just play what he heard on the radio, just so. Every line from the radio, he was just split. My jobs were anything I could do in the building trade, from a Ricky's mate to, to carpenter's mate to hod carrier. And in the end, my trade ended up being a scaffolder. At the outside of that, I was always DJing, I was always doing uh, a wedding or a club or I was always doing a birthday party, I was always doing something. Even though I was DJing being a self-employed, I, I took up a, a carpet cleaning job and I used to do all the clubs in Brighton. So I used to clean all the clubs in Brighton and wine bars as well in the dead of night. And this was for me was something which um, gave me a lot of grounding but also it made me more more forceful to, to actually do something. I think he, he turned himself away himself. I mean we spoke to him, you know, really spoke to him, but I think he did it on his own. I think he found out that he's going the wrong path on his own, and he did it himself. My God, my brother's so big, but, and, and, I just, and I can't really get over how big he really is, and how people talk about him in a really nice way, how, how they love his music and how, what he does. It just makes me feel really proud, really, that I am, He's my brother, you know. I wonder myself, what is the catch, you know? Why do people, because when I'm with him, people come up to say, you're the greatest Carl Cox, you're the best Carl Cox. And I thought, what? Um, Carl Cox to me is just like my uncle. It doesn't really mean much to me. He means a lot to me, but his name, whereas to a lot of other people, it'd be like, oh my gosh, it's Carl Cox. But to me, it's just my uncle. To many people, He's 
Carl God, whoa, what is there, you know, King God, whatever. But, you know, I know him as Carl, and I've always known him as that. And, you know, that's why, for me, you know, he's, he's, he's very much a star for many people, but he's a star in a different way for me, you know, he's, he's Carl. He's progressed and changed as a human like we all do, but he hasn't, his, his ego hasn't. He's still the Carl that I met 14 or some years ago. We were in Colombia, and not even the main capital, we were walking out of the airport, and then we were walking down, this little kid comes up with a paper and a pen, and I'm like, I'm fucking in Colombia, in the middle of nowhere, and he comes out, and this kid is really happy to get his autograph. I think, yeah, if you're worldwide like that, and even small kids in Colombia know who you are, yeah. That's... He's getting famous, more famous, every year, and, and it gets bigger and it gets better, and then I think, one minute, no, he's my brother, and then I think, oh my God, my brother's famous. Now he's just famous for being Carl Cox. It's like, it's like if you're that famous, you don't have to explain it. He just is Carl Cox. To Bridgetown, Barbados. The weather is fine with a maximum temperature of 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The sky is blue and the palm trees are really cool. It's been really difficult to come here you know, to see my mum and dad because of the way how, how things have happened for me, you know. But as, as I get older and as things have, 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 have gone along, I've been able to start to take more time to see my mum and dad because, you know, they're not getting any younger as well. You know, every year you just don't know what's going to happen to each, each of them. Even myself, I don't know what's going to happen to me. But it's really important to, now to, 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 to have and create more family ties as things go along. Because, you know, no matter what, you know, your family comes first, and no matter what happens, it doesn't matter how successful I am. For the family, um, he's looked after us over the years. Um, you know, we've kept in contact with him. We always know where he is. Um, if we had any problems, we would be able to talk to him. Um, or he's always there. He's very, he's very loyal to his family. He's very loving towards his family because even though he doesn't see us that often, we still mean quite a lot to him. And he's just a person with just a very, very big heart. I am so proud of him. I am really, really proud of him, you know, of my son. I'm proud. How you doing? Well, welcome to uh, Melbourne, Australia, to my home. Everything is big in Australia. Could you have you know, a lot of land to do a lot of stuff on? And this house here is on two thirds of an acre. And it has everything that I need to, to enjoy my, my life here. Straight away, all you have here is a lot of space. And the kitchen area, for me, is where I, I do a lot of my entertaining, cooking, uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a cook also, so obviously being in Australia, you need to be able to cook something. Uh, most of the time it's a barbecue, as you will see outside here. Um, we do a lot of uh, entertaining outside here as well. I have this back part of the house. So there's a tennis court, swimming pool, uh, everything you need to, to relax. And I think that's really important. My life is really hectic and, you know, I need some normality in it. It has to be something which is about just me, the person, and not me, the DJ. So me being here is me, the person, and I feel very happy about that, liberated also, almost. Because people, most people want me to be Carl Cox, the DJ. I mean, I've built that persona up for sure, um, but again, it, you know, Carl Cox isn't a pseudonym for anything, that's my name, that's who I am, and that's what I wanted to, to live my life by. But there has to be a balance of what, of what I do as a DJ and what I do as a normal person. You know, yes, I'll go, I'll go to the laundrette. Yes, I'll go, well, not actually, I don't go to the laundrette, actually. I go to the dry cleaners. Uh, but yes, I'll go and get my own shopping. Yes, I'll go and get my own fuel and that sort of stuff, you know. Uh, I don't have butlers or anything like that running around, you know, doing things for me. Um, it's all about what my balance of my life is. And I feel that I'm able to have that here above everything else. Looked out the garden one day and there it was. I was like, who put that there? And no one would own up, so. But I'd have got a really good idea, but you know, it's a little bit of England <laughs> into my garden right there. It's 
kind of like the Carcott's kingdom of what you would like to have in the garage. Monaro, Ducati, Harley Davidson, some dirt bikes, um, and your records. These records basically uh, start from 90, uh, 1963 and they end up being over here, uh, year 2006, when I stopped, stopped buying more vinyl. You know, most of these records I, I bought from a record store. I went and earned my money respectively and sat there and shipped through loads of records and, and made sure I bought what I liked. Most of the records here that I've got are the ones that I, I listened to and I bought because I like them. If I have to work out how, how many pieces of vinyl is here, it's got to be over 150,000 pieces. It's a lot. Um, it took two 20-foot containers to, to ship over here from England. All my vehicles, they all have uh, CCX number plates on. Some people were looking at it at the beginning with just to think that they were like Roman numerals, but uh, it was uh, either you see CC as Cole Cox and the X being the Cox, or you can kind of think that the, the second C is an O, so it looks like Cox. But I didn't want the Cox on the number plate. This is my uh, studio where it all happens. I do all my radio, stations, uh, radio shows here do my mixes, compilations, and I'm working on my new Cole Cox albums at the moment as well. But this is a really good sized room. Um, the idea of having a 42 inch plasma was that I was able to do a lot of uh, movie links and and, uh, and, um, and making music to, to adverts and stuff like that, so you need the screen, um, which, is, which is absolutely brilliant. But as you can see, many years ago, you used to, the studio used to consist of a lot of hardware, and now most of the stuff that, you, that you're using is all in the computer now. So you don't actually need a big, massive room to have a really good elaborate studio. I just have one MIDI keyboard which fires off, fires off everything that I need from, from my computer. And, uh, and I just have a lot of fun here. Around where I live, it's a peninsula. This is a part of it. We're in Mornington right now, and this is one of the reasons why I fall in love with being in Melbourne. Instantly, it gives me exactly what I need, and that's peace, tranquility, grounding, put in what you like. But at the end of the day, I feel good about being here. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, not many people get to see me in a suit. Normally, it's for weddings, but for today, but today it's for a court case. Um, because the one of the reasons why I'm here in Melbourne is that today um, I'm actually trying to get some money back from a, a deposit that I laid down on a business which didn't go through. So I'm really looking for justice based on how I feel about it, and also I think the principle. Of the, of the reason of how you don't treat other people in business. Uh, so today, hopefully, we get the right result. Um, this has been over the last six months of, of trying to do this, uh, trying to get involved in this business, and it's basically, I've ended up with nothing. So uh, I'm just looking for a little bit of justice today. Even though initially when I was buying the, the, the business that it was, it was something that I needed to deal with, in the end, it wasn't my problem or my sense to deal with it. Was, it was down to them because every time that they, they couldn't get mm. to a point, it, my timeline was running out. Well, that's essentially it, isn't it? There was an implied term that there would be a renewal of the lease because it had to happen. It, had to it should have taken place by the 14th of July. It didn't. So therefore, implicitly, which pushed me out of contract. It pushed you out of the contract. So no, it's called promissory estoppel. Mm. What the hell is that? It's, it's 15th century law, essentially. <laughs> and that is where people weren't happy with what the law was, so they went to the king. Right. And they said, excuse me, it's, it's the law of equity. It's basically, regardless of what the law says, 
this is wrong. Right. That's how I feel about it. I know. <laughs> and, uh, I feel exactly like that. Anyway. Sounds, sounds right to me. <laughs> let's go and spin some discs. <laughs> I wish it was as easy as that. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> after a day that I've had a court, which is uh, very interesting to say the least. There's still no resolution on that. But meanwhile, I'm here in Paran. I'm gonna go meet my friends at a very nice restaurant called Fog and kind of reflect on what I've got to do next. And what I've got to do next is travel all the way back to Europe uh, on the Malaysian Airlines, all the way through to Kuala Lumpur. After that, I get to Heathrow Airport, from Heathrow Airport, I get on and do a festival called the Inox Festival in uh, Toulouse, and then after that, I'm going to be heading off to France to do some TV work. So uh, my life continues after the day that I've had. And meanwhile, hopefully, the, by next week, we'll find out what's going to happen to me based on the situation that we all now know about, which was uh, not very good, but I'm going to be enjoying myself now and having a few drinks with a couple of my mates. Danny, how you doing, Eric? All right, how <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> and he's dragged you out here today, has he? <laughs> Probably we'll have a few drinks today also. Anyway, see you later, guys. This is technology, just sent that off my computer and it just comes straight back as a reply and say thank you on my telephone. Why are you talking to your computer? <laughs> Why, Why, is you talking? <laughs> Why is your computer talking back? <laughs> no <idea. laughs> so tonight, all of these arches yeah. are being carried over. This is where your slide display is going to go. Oh, okay. yeah. All these shops are being blacked out. This is the first time that, that, that they've done this here in heaven. So when people come back through here for the first time, they'll be like, oh. that'd be pretty amazing. People are not going to expect, they're going to expect some, uh, some banners, <laughs> spray banners from many years ago and put the black light on and they will come up like that, you know? <laughs> this is Carl's mixer that he designed with, mix, with Vestax six years ago. We, we actually went to Japan, set everything up. Certain features on here that you won't find on many other, or, or at the time you wouldn't have found on many uh, mixers. <laughs> there is a certain setup which is always current, but it's always updated because he's very much, he doesn't like to stand still and he likes to see what's out there and utilizes uh, the best equipment available for uh, the shows that he puts on. Cole's passion and, and love for technology um, has always shown me a side that he stays on top of his game by being being on the road and having to adapt uh, into his environment. Uh, he evolves with the times. I remember back in the day he was spinning on three turntables, which was an amazing thing. Today he's using it with CDJs and he's advancing as, as the uh, industry advances. Going to the bank, then we're going over to uh, the O2, another good reason for taking the bike. We're going to go and check out, um, they've asked us to go up because they want us to do some work there next year, so we're going to go and have a look at it. So then I'm meeting the kids, it went right. pretty well. Uh, I'm sort of going over to the O2 now, check out the venue there, and uh, see if we can do a cold cops of friends in London.
we're standing on the stage now actually, so it will be... I mean, the configuration, you'll recognise from fabric anyway. Yeah. Stage here, DJ, DJ booth there, there. Yep. and it's just that we've got more terraces. This metal frame here, yeah. going around. You know, at fabric, we've got that body sonic floor That's underneath. Right, yeah. And this is a sort of the next generation one of those, which has actually got um, these things called butt kickers underneath there. And they actually strike the underside of the floor. Just the whole energy from, from that strike comes On up the dance floor. and basically gets conducted yeah, through the body. We've done it quite a few times where we've just had an empty warehouse and then we've got to basically put something in there which is yeah. exciting visually as well yeah. as as well as well what you get from the DJs and the music and stuff which is also important. But, you know, once it's all gone, it's just a room. Don't get carried away with the building, it's just the building. You've got to hear the sound system, that's what's yeah. going to make this place yeah. rock. What, what it is, yeah, and the soundproof in this, that, that really is amazing. Because Twilo was always a good club, only because it was all soundproofed. That's yeah. why the sound was so brilliant. Yeah. Then they could really pinpoint exactly what they wanted from yeah. a frequency point of view. Yeah. of why that room sound is so bloody good. Yeah. Apart from the dance floor bit here, where would the, part, would the, oh, the, the chairs would be here? No, no, the chairs are there. It's already there. It's about 1,500 standing. Um, When I do things now, it's, there's, a, there's a reason for it, not just, just because. And I want people to understand that it's not an everyday occurrence me playing in London like, yeah. it, like it used to be before. Yeah. Uh, but to be honest, it's always been a little bit special me playing in London. But then it, it was special because I was also working with other people. So I was working with all the other DJs as well. So it's like a massive event in itself. These events now are, are Cole Cox events. It's based on what I want to give to people and then bring in what I believe to be the best talent or the best the uh, music that you can possibly get in, in any venue based on what I like and, and my ears have always been good to me based on what I like so you know if I bring in a certain DJ or, or certain live act or whatever because I believe that that's the very best you're going to get and I want them involved in the venue as well. The first time I, uh, I, I played for him actually was at his, uh, his night in Ibiza at Space and for me that was like I, I think for me it was perfect. I think it's still like one of the best gigs I've, I've done so far. At the end of the day, the scene always needs a future. And Carl's always spearheaded that. He's always supported it. He's understood it. He's understood that a whole new generation has come through since he first began playing. Uh, Josh Wink had invited him to come to play at Fluid. And it was in March that time. He came and just destroyed it. We stayed until the end to introduce ourselves as producers and gave Carl a CD of ours and the next thing we know we had um, emails from Carl's people uh, and then things just blossomed from there. I mean Carl's been a great support for us. He, he was definitely kind of, I, I sort of moved down to come to college and he definitely kind of took me under his wing and sort of like became sort of mentor. <laughs> Carl Cox, 24 hours at the O2, playing <laughs> all these various venues. <laughs> what, yeah, other, what, other, what other DJ has ever played 24 hours? You reckon you can play for 24 hours? It'd be a tough call, but I think I could do it. Yeah! Who wants to take me on? To do something like this, I'll probably, I would probably do the live, Cold Cox live show, yeah. which would tag on the new album, because I'm working on a new album at the okay. moment as well, and all that sort of stuff. So that all lends itself to so record yeah. companies get involved and everyone yeah, else yeah. and blah, 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 for a our, process, for, for our yeah. un, you know, the one-off unique Cold Cox London show based on um, you know, the live element to it, yeah. plus everything else around that. We're going to sign contracts now. We're doing... What, for wrestling? <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> we just played it at the WWF. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, what a day. And it's raining. Oh man. Well, it's been a long day today. Yeah. Um, you know, trying to look at these venues. And it's always, we always try to do something a little bit different in the end of the day based on what we do. And, and uh, actually, there's a few venues in here that are, you know, they, over the, the time that they've been building the concept of, of bringing people here and you know, we, we want to have a look and see what's going on also. It's actually quite interesting. It's very, I would say, 21st century now. Everyone's talking about the... It's very Las Vegas, actually. It's, it, it's, it's very turning American. into London, America's Las Vegas.
I've been here in Orsham for, for many years and I feel like it serves its purpose for what I need to do uh, in the sense of being who I am now. You know, I don't need to buy a house for convenience, I need to buy a house because I actually want to be there and I actually like the area that I want to be in. And I always found that I had an affinity with Brighton in some ways. Um, for me, going there in 1984, and, and my career stemmed from Brighton. I think it's only fitting now for my outro of my career that I still end up in Brighton uh, because I love it as a place I always have done. So, which 41-year-old model do you want? <laughs> this one or this one? <laughs> this one's going to last another 40 years. So that is the question, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> this one hasn't done too bad. One, this one do not done too bad. Here's the most famous... Uh, Twin over a camera, it's called Tina Engine. This car was completely um, redone, stripped, stripped out. out. Everything was stripped out. He uh, sandblasted the, the body, new wings, new doors, all sorts of things on it. And, um, and then he had it all uh, repainted and then, then put it all back together. Ken Lo fan. <laughs> How sweet is that? <laughs> no. I've seen some, I've seen some Cortina Lotus, it's got, it's got Cortina on the side. Some don't have Cortina on, the, on there. But there's a lot of stock Cortina. Most, most people, if they don't like them with the steels, yeah. they put the minstrel wheels on or yeah. Cosmic. Um, I haven't seen any with Revolution wheels on. Because they used to have Revolution, the black four spoke. Yeah, 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 yeah. Revolutions. I always like that on the Cortina. I just come over to the bikes. I mean, I never do anything by half, to be honest. Um, but uh, since I passed my test two years ago, um, these kind of bikes are all the, all the kind of bikes that I like to ride. And this bike here, we'll start off here, is the 600 Hornet. And I kind of like a test on a bike similar to this one. But what I like about it, if you're on your own, it's really light. It's, it's, it's got a 600 uh, CBR engine detuned in it. Um, and it upright, it's a naked kind of type street bike. But then I went for King Daddy of all bikes. Uh, still today, Danny Petroza, Nicky Hayden. Still flashing the colors of Repsol around the motor GP track at the moment. Very easy bike to ride, actually. The uh, CBR 1000RR, uh, Honda Fireblade. But meanwhile, the most comfortable bike, but also the most powerfulest bike, uh, apart from this one, because this one still <laughs> will have you off the back of the bike, is the uh, Suzuki Hayabusa. Basically, when it came out, a lot of people was, was shocked by the looks uh, and, um, and how it rode, and you know, it had all these things about it, but a bike that could do 200 miles an hour was always something that a lot of people were like well, curious about. I just enjoyed it because A, it's really safe, B, it's really comfortable to see. If you do have a pillion, they're not too worried about being on a bike for, for a long time as well. And it's just a really, really nice bike to ride. It's got a good balance on it. You can, you can still take it around the racetrack if you really wanted to, put a bit more effort into it, and then you get what you want out of the bike. But I just really enjoy it. And also, it's kind of controversial in the way that it looks. So people have always got an opinion, whether they like the front, hate the back, hate the back, like the front, whatever. It's still a talking point of, of having a motorbike in such a way. I think the, the, the biker instinct has always been within me, but never exercised it until now. And now that I've exercised it, passed my test in all the re relevant places, do my advanced riding courses and do my super bike, super bike schools and get out on track days, you can't stop me. I, I'm here to stay and I really, really enjoy it. Looking at bringing some sort of activity here. Yeah. It's like a chill out area. Yeah. Chill out, you know, marketplace type thing. Seven, eight hundred thousand people are getting there here. And where's the bar yeah. for here? Back here. But what we're going to do is build additional bars around. So. And where's the nearest toilets in this place? Yeah, here. They're just through there. Here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Here it is. Self contained, then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Couple of screens up here, yeah. showing yeah. down yeah. yeah, yeah. But you can link it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you wanted, you can link the music if you wanted, or you can have your own music. Well, yeah. we can take a view, maybe. I mean, but it would be good to see the visual of downstairs. Yeah. 
really for that package, it's more um, the visual side of it and the you know the screens yeah. and all yeah. that sort of stuff. With the lighting, I'm not as fast, so okay. you can choose for that as well. Okay. Sound. I don't know. I don't know who these guys are. Um, what next, those people? I will send you a link over. Okay. Um, have a look at it. Yeah. Get them to quote for it. Okay. See what they say. Yeah. If it's not something you want to do. Not a problem. The biggest thing, uh, especially with Carl in England, is that we work with promoters and it's people understanding the respect and you know the quality of promotion and everything that we do. Um, and it's just getting into the head of that promoter that you know, no, this is not your event, this is a Carl Cox and Friends event, and we do it our way. So we don't go in thinking how much money can we make, we go in thinking what's the best show that we can do, and everybody's happy. Looking for a nice place to to live back in Brighton again. But I've always loved Brighton, and I've kind of forgotten what it's like to, to, to be back down here again. As my kind of like home when I kind of grew up, and then I kind of grew up here when I, my career started to take off. But also a lot of my friends here as well, and stuff like that. When I moved to Brighton, he was the biggest DJ in Brighton, and. As an aspiring DJ, I felt drawn towards him. A, a great deal of the people who are Cole's friends with are from Brighton. Um, you know, he's he's got he's got a lot of roots here, and he, and he's and he's he's really loved here. We'd be neighbours again, but I think it'll be more about just hanging out together rather than making tunes. Because the thing is, we've we've both been doing it for so long, and. Yeah, we're more likely to play table football than make a tune together. And I've got a new table, come. This is the kitchen area. Oh. It goes, goes right to the front. Yeah. Some, some old gits left in my own lotus cool chain on that side. <laughs> 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 <What>? <laughs> it's the rocking room. Oh, I like this. I know, it's nice, isn't it? Thank you. Yeah. Put the world to rights. Hey, it's... <laughs> yeah, we used to have a big analogue desk and all that, and we slowly on digit, more digital and more digital. Yeah. Well, thanks for today, Kev. Good to see you. Good to see the old Lotus. Yeah, I thought you might appreciate that. Yeah. I really like the house. I think it's really, really nice. It's, um, it ticks off all the right boxes for me, and there's so much room for manoeuvring, in a sense of you know, turning it into what I would like to have at the end of the day. And, and also, that the house has, actually has a bit of history from many years ago of, of, of the music that's been produced at that place as well, because it was primarily a place where a lot of artists made a lot of hit records too. Uh, and, and that's always really nice to know that that house had, had good vibes about it, you know, it had something, to, had something positive about the house. Brighton has changed in a sense, um, because of new money, new energy, new people, new ideas. But the actual place itself is, is the same. With the, the building architecture, the lanes, seafront, and I feel that's quite endearing of what makes this place so special. It was a really good opportunity for me to come down and do something completely on my own for what kind of got me who I am today because I basically stood out from the crowd based on the parties that I did here and how I kind of instigated all the rave scene from here and and, um, and basically built my name here with all the DJs and, and uh, all the management and and everyone to do with the Brighton scene. I was a very big part of that from the very early days. I was quite, kind of responsible and in the end for a lot of the things that you see happening now here in Brighton um, based on what wasn't happening when I, when I first came to Brighton and that was in 1985. I think and Carl, if he set his mind to something and then he's working with a, a good knit team like Lynn and Ian, 
that he can probably create whatever he really wants to do. And the, the challenge for him is just to be able to ask the question is what I want to, you know, what is it that I want to do? He wants to give and he will keep giving and that's, that's the type of person he is. He's, got, he's a big man, he's got a big heart with it, you know, and this is, he's, he's, a, he's a character and people, people see this in him, you know. And then, you know, when you've been DJing for a certain period of time and you have played so many amazing festivals, so many great residences, great clubs, one-off events, you don't think to yourself, oh, well, you know, th there must be something more because the fact that what you do week in, week out is probably the best of the best that's out there, that, that's what keeps you excited, that's what keeps you driven. I don't think he's got any other mountains to climb, he's done it. He's been absolutely everywhere, you know, can, if he was another planet, he'd probably conquer that too. There's enough energy, there's enough uh, inspiration to go on, to move on the next 10 years. Yeah. If someone could, um, you know, is going to have a party on the moon, then I think it's going to be Coxie that's, that's playing it, really, you know. I don't think there's anywhere else to go apart from space. Carl's acting in movies, um, I think it's, it's a hobby for him. Uh, I think uh, he's good at it and he should probably continue uh, doing that. You know, tried to be being the being the hard man in the in the gangster movies, um, but um, he's it, been too much of a softie, isn't he? Really. <laughs> uh, I think when you're at the top, you can't go higher. Yeah, he got some DJ awards. He got some good records, a label, a nice tour, a bus tour, a great friend, a great tour manager. <laughs> Um, I think maybe the last thing he wants maybe is to win the Grand Prix as a motorbike driver. I think it's motorbike, Grand Cross, something. I think this gonna be, this is a little dream in his head. Yeah, I know it. He want to be like uh, Valentino Rossi or some other guy. I think. Uh, Carl presume that he has a beautiful house in Australia. He tells me a lot of times he wants to go and live in Australia, etc. I am jealous about Australia. <laughs> I can see him begin in Australia, begin to enjoy the fruits of his labor, of his job, of his work, by going out and riding bikes like he likes to do. There's Carl Cox in South London, back home basically. It's quite extensive because we've got to do uh, quite a bit of filming and uh, as well as uh, interviews for the SW4 party. So, so we start off this morning with uh, some makeup. Well, wasn't me. <laughs> yes. Um, I was with. I feel safe in. So are you in Korea? We are in Korea. Ah, oh, so well, one and a half, two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah, we yes. went to Korea just for you, you know. Yes. It really, it was nice to, to see you. Guys. <laughs> no problem. It was a pleasure. <laughs> because, because we well, you know. Yeah. We'll get there in time. You see, he got me out in the daytime, you see. It's like, <laughs> not many people see him in the daytime. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> oh, I'm going to get so done. You know what? I did get done, actually, once, when my, my posters went up, and I got the bill. Went straight to my house. <laughs> I'm going to get done. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, Hi, I'm DJ Carl Cox and I'm sat here in Clapham Common for the 2008 Southwest 4. Looking forward to it, of course. I'm really looking forward to putting this together and, and showing the world what it's really like to be Carl Cox uh, from an interesting point of view. And uh, you also get to see my sisters and my mum and dad and my niece, so that should be quite funny <laughs> to see them in the limelight. I don't get to go and see them often. But when, when he's in town, I will try my best to get to, to go and see him. So I'm looking forward to going to see him now in Clapham. So I can't wait for that. The first time was Clapham Common. And I took some of my friends along with me. And just to see people like going crazy over my uncle, that was just really weird. It was a really like nice feeling to like, it's just, like looking at what he's achieved, all these people like jumping up and down and going crazy for him.
basically the idea today is uh, it's a stamp the fact that I'm doing SW4 right. and uh, let's get some really good shots of the common and and, uh, and for people to see that my involvement is quite extensive. I've never really been driven by you know what has been seen as a success you know try and get a top number one hit record on on the radio try try and get on top of the pops try and get on MTV all this sort of stuff I've done all of that but I've did all of that through what I believe in with my music and who I am as an individual and and that's all I've ever done I've, I've always followed the path of what I feel is is a part of me and what, what makes me who I am December, January, February into March um, is where I'll spend my time uh, for the summer in Australia. And then after, the, uh, and then after that, I think I'll come back and all, I always play in Miami. And then, then whatever happens after that with my European gigs. So, so I'm here in Europe, I'm playing Prague, Macedonia, Italy, Germany, France, everything you can think of. And, then, and of course, our summer season in, our, in Ibiza takes me right up until September into uh, into October, and then I'll go off to America, do America uh, all over, at Canada as well, uh, maybe South America, and then kind of then get myself over to Asia, and then back to Australia. So that is my. And that's your calendar surf. every year. Every year. And yeah, do you take any time out? Yeah. Well, in Australia. That, that is your time. That, that is my time out. Yeah. yeah. yeah that was really good. I mean, it's it's really positive to to have you know, people who are genuinely interested in, in, in events like this in South London and me being a part of you know, South London culture. <laughs> I think coming it's, back. Um, it's, it's a bit good. more than that. It's, it's actually like you coming back to uh, England as well. Mm, I think so. It, 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 it's kind of stamping the idea that I haven't really gone away and I'm still here and I'm still here for everybody by, by what I did in my early days. And if, and if not, yeah. it's, it kind of... It really shows that after all these years, I still do this because I love it still, you know? Yeah. Step back, step forward, go right, slow. Hi, do you want to come through? Nope. Yes. I feel like we're in the doctors or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, sort out my hemorrhoids. <laughs> Get Pete to sort out my hemorrhoids. Hey, mate. How are you? Hey, I'm very well. Pete, how are you doing? I'll tell you what, it's really nice in here, isn't it? It's fantastic. <laughs> it's better than pirate radio days. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> like, got going on. I mean, I'm on the day off today, you know, I'm and here I am, Pete, you know. <laughs> All well, Ver Vernon, I did the breakfast show the other day and Vernon Kay came in, so I thought, you know, you've got, you got a weekend off, you can come in. <laughs> <laughs> By order of Pete Tong. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, I was trying to think the first time we met, and I... And you used to do sound systems for me. Many years ago, Pete. In fact, though, it goes, but to be honest, it goes even further than that with the old case to Soul and Funk days. Well, even though I was doing sound systems stuff at that time, I was actually a punter, you know, drive my old Mark Uncle Tina to Caster, Great Yarmouth, and get my old uh, shaving foam out and do the old pyramids and stuff in front of uh, Pete and, and Froggy, <laughs> uh, God rest his soul, and, uh, and everyone else. And, you know, I was a strict punter. I went to hear the music and hear the DJs right there. And you was what, definitely one of those DJs was Pete was a young and up and coming DJ then you see. So imagine this, it was me and Paul Oakenfold and Trevor Fung, a place in Croydon, and we were spot we had Carl Cox doing the sound system. <laughs> Talking of memories as well, another one, uh, Space 2004. Carl, do you remember your birthday? <laughs> <laughs> Not a chance, I'll tell you. It all depends Lynn's right. putting her hand across her face. <laughs> it all depends if they saw me when I was wearing a, um, not a tutu, um, toga, when right. I was doing a party after manumission, which was uh, something of an interesting time, because I was also wearing a blonde wig at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> now, just look, you've done this mix for us uh, ahead yeah. of time. Just looking down the track list, and you've been busy, man. You've been making music again as well. Yeah, you know, it's it's um, it took a while, Pete, I have to say, and uh, finding your feet with the sound and the music and everything. But right now, I'm really pleased. I'm, I'm kind of feeling good about the music I'm making and also farming some of the tracks out to get remixes and everything. And, and I'm really happy with the results. And this is a part of the new album. <laughs> Baby. Baby, 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 baby. There you go. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one of mine if you give me that one. <laughs> <laughs>
Absolutely, Pete. I'm glad to, to uh, enjoy that uh, that track. It's, we've done it about uh, six six weeks ago, and uh, with John Rundell, and yeah, it's great. Funk it's it. got a good funk to it. You got a radio show as well. It's, it tell us about that. You're giving me some competition here. Yeah, global. <laughs> it's um, it's pretty extensive actually. We've got 24 countries worldwide, and it's going out to roughly five million listeners every week. It's pretty damn good based on that. I started it about three years ago, and it was you know it just kind of grew organically. You can do a request now. <laughs> yeah, I've got to do a few shout outs actually. Let's, let's give him a demo. Come on, come on. <laughs> okay. Um, got to say a, a real good hi actually to uh, Darren, Emerson, Kate, and and a new Whoa. addition. Ben, you know, because uh, he's a very happy man at the moment, Darren, and then he's, he's big smiles on his face. Uh, to Robin Finley and to Jumper, who's looking after my house in Mallorca, to my sisters, Pamela and Andrea, and my niece, Rihanna, and Andy and Arena at the moment, who are cooking for us by the time we leave here, we're going to get some amazing food. And to June, who I met today, who actually put the makeup on my face today. Do I look fine <laughs> or not? I don't know. Uh, happy birthday to June. Come on, China's singing. Not bad, by the way, not bad. <laughs> Carl Cox in the mix. <laughs> What's that coming over the hill? Ah. Is it a monster? Is it a Look monster? Look at that car! <laughs> <laughs> it's been uh, fantastic having you on the show. Thank you, Pete. It's been a pleasure. Again. It's been an absolute pleasure. Before I go, actually... Take more weekends off. <laughs> Before I go, actually, Pete, I've got to say, the reason why I had makeup on my face because I had a photo shoot today. Right. That was all. <laughs> you weren't joining the Scissor Sisters. <laughs> <laughs> You've been playing those places in London lately, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Thank you, Pete. It's been amazing. Thank you, Radio 1 listeners. Right. Look, he was sat in a little wine bar, and we all came over to join him, and he stood up and made sure that everyone had a seat, and he was pulling seats over and things like that. Now, OK, that's normal procedure for a really nice guy, but a normal, you know, for someone in that position, sometimes people act in completely the opposite. And he's always got a time for a smile or inter for an interview or picture. He's always yes, and more, and uh, excellent, and marvelous, and amazing. He's got the grin. <laughs> the little Cheshire cat grin. He's, he's always in the groove, and he has energy. He, 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 he smiles, he communicates with the people. I think that that's, makes Carl so outstanding. He's a person única, irrepetible, magnífica. Y sobre todo tiene un corazón que cabe todo el mundo. Everybody can be in his heart because he loves everybody.